All right, everyone. So thank you for being here this evening. Welcome to York College of Pennsylvania's Spartan Speak series. Uh, my name is Danny Robbins, and I'm going to be your host this evening. I am a 2016 Recreation Leadership graduate, and I'm currently working in the Enrollment Communications Office uh, as an assistant, um, but my career is in camp, summer camping and youth development. Um, so my role tonight is pretty simple, just going to, you know, give us a little intro, give us some reminders. I'll be here throughout the presentation. If you have any questions or uh, have any issues, you can just chat me um, and then I'll wrap us up at the end. So a couple of those reminders, we ask that you please uh, stay on mute throughout the presentation, um, just so it's easier for everyone to hear it. And then, uh, of course, that is not the case at the end during the live Q&A, if you would like to unmute um, and ask any questions of our presenter, that would be great. Uh, if you'd prefer to put your questions in the chat, you can also do that. We also suggest that you switch over to um, speaker view instead of gallery view, kind of the best way to uh, view the presentation. Um, and then also just a reminder that this is a series. So we are about midway, maybe a little over midway through. Um, the Spartan Speak series runs every Tuesday and Thursday evening until April 20th. Um, and that's at 6.30 p.m. So you can view uh, all of the uh, episodes in the series. You can watch the old ones uh, that have been recorded and you can see what's coming up next. And uh, that's at www.ycp.edu forward slash Spartan hyphen speaks. Um, so check those out and get registered uh, for more. I'm very excited uh, to introduce tonight's topic and presenter. We're going to be discussing the compelling and loaded question of is lying in medicine okay? Um, and I'm also just very excited to have uh, Rory Kraft here, who I took in uh, two extra times when I was an undergrad, just because I enjoyed intro to philosophy so much. Um, and I think I chose you for uh, intro because of your um, your rate my professor score. So um, I don't know if that's a dig at the other professors in the department, but uh, it was well worth it. I learned a ton. And so I'm going to toss it over to you, Rory, and then we'll get the, the video started. So thanks, Danny. And I actually have a hard time believing that it was 2016 was when you graduated because it seems like it was just the other day. Uh, so thank you all for, for joining us and a shout out to the first dude, JL, here for, for joining us. He's the, the, the first gentleman of, of the campus. Uh, glad to see him as well. Always fun to see him around. Um, so what we have tonight is I actually had pre-recorded a, a short uh, lecture with slides to kind of have everything work out well. Um, so that's pre-recorded. So you're going to get to jump back in time about a month, month and a half. You'll see my hair get shorter um, as we go through. So we're going to do that. And at the beginning of that, I actually do have a brief sort of self-introduction to myself, but I want to supplement that right now by um, explaining a little bit more. Um, so I'm a philosopher and I'm chair of the Department of the Arts and Humanities. And so under Arts and Humanities, um, we have philosophy, my, my core area. We also have medical humanities, which ties into the topic for today, um, as well as lots of other courses in, in programs in fine arts and theater, in music, um, film, all over the place. We, we are the best department at the school. I'm convinced of that. Um, so that's where we have. And at this point, I think I'm just going to throw it back to myself for, for the lecture. Um, and then afterwards, we'll do the live Q&A and we'll, we'll see what happens from there. So again, thank you all for coming. Yes, thank you. All right, I'm going to share my screen. Hello, and welcome to this talk, which is, is Lying Okay in Medicine. Before we really jump in, I thought I'd take an opportunity to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Rory Kraft. I'm a philosopher by training. I'm chair of the Department of Arts and Humanities. 
I focus in my own work in a lot of questions in ethics, uh, particularly in applied ethics and medical ethics and business ethics. Um, really fascinated in questions surrounding those. And among the programs that I do a lot of work in here at the college are in the environmental sustainability programs and also the medical humanities program, which is one of the programs that I helped found here. So what we're gonna be looking at today is a question that really is central in many ways to an understanding of medical ethics. And that is a question about truth telling or lying in medicine. So perhaps the easiest way to start out is to think about a really simple case, a really simple example of when we might think that we would uh, encounter medical professionals that would be not telling the whole truth in some sense. So let's imagine that we have a patient. We'll call him John. And as a physician, you are worried about John's smoking habits. Um, you know that John is a musician, that he sings, that he has a family, and you really have tried over the years to convince him to stop smoking, but have been unable to do so. One of the things that you've heard of other physicians doing is that perhaps they might want to come to John and show him the impact of smoking. And it'd be really easy to show him the example of, here's a long of for someone who's been smoking for a long time, and here's someone who hasn't been smoking. But your worry is that if you do that, that then John might say, well, let's look at my lungs and see how I'm doing there. So instead, what possibility that many physicians have discussed considering um, and, and have said that they've used at points is to pull up an x-ray of John's lungs. Now, this is just a x-ray of otherwise healthy lungs, but if you're not used to looking at x-rays, it is easy to pick out aspects of it that could potentially be used to scare John into quitting smoking. So you might ask him to look at sort of the threads and weaving that's going out here. And so you could use these aspects and say to John, look, look at the way that this is happening here. We can see from the way that they're expanding outward and that they don't extend all the way through the lungs that there's an issue here, and so we're seeing really early signs of damage from smoking. Now, this is totally false. There is nothing wrong with the lungs that are pictured here. There is nothing going on here that would indicate that there's a problem going on. But if John is not used to reading x-rays, if John doesn't know what's going on, it might be something that would cause him to change his health habits to change the process of action he's going through and to indeed quit smoking. So if this has the good outcome, if this leads to John quitting smoking, would this be a good outcome or not? So this is just a really basic example of a situation that we might consider. Now, as someone who loves teaching medical ethics, one of the things that I do is that I walk my students through the Hippocratic Oath. Um, so it, we spent a whole class period reading the Hippocratic Oath, which is not very long, uh, to really understand what's going on there, to really understand the roots of Western medicine, to really understand from the beginnings the oaths and traditions that were being taken there. So the Hippocratic Oath uh, dates from around 400 BC. We don't have an exact date on it. Um, and what it really was, was it was an oath of initiation for members of the Pythagorean cult studying medicine. So the Pythagoreans, you know, the A squared plus B squared equals C squared people, um, they split off into a couple of different groups, one of which um, ended up doing a lot of early investigation into medicine. And it's out of that group that we get the, we get the, the Hippocratic Oath coming forward. Now, we don't have time here to go through the whole oath, though it's amazing and awesome, and I love to teach the Hippocratic Oath, but there are a couple of aspects here that are really fascinating. So at points in the oath, the physician-to-be takes the oath, takes the claim that they will practice medicine 
according to my ability and judgment. So it's not for in consultation with the patient. It's not for in keeping with what experts say should happen. Instead, it's what I, the physician, think should happen. My judgment, my ability, this is how I'm going to practice medicine. So this is potentially troubling, and this also points to a way that we can actually see back to the beginning of Western medicine that it was the physician's judgment that was considered to be most important. The other part here that plays in is that a portion of the oath is taking an oath to keep the patients from harm and injustice. And it's a really broad statement. It's a fascinating thing that's a broad statement. But in this broad statement of keeping your patients from harm and injustice, this is the physician saying that if I have a relationship, if I have a doctor-patient relationship with somebody, I'm going to do my job to keep that patient from harm. Now, does that mean telling John that he has early stages of lung problems? I don't know, but that's something that certainly would be permissible under the Hippocratic Oath, which may be a reason that we don't want to use the Hippocratic Oath, but instead we want to go to something far more recent. So just a key text in contemporary bioethics is a book read written by Beecher and Childress, who I have pictured here. Um, and so their book, um, Principles of Biomedical Ethics, really is a, a touchstone, a cornerstone of contemporary bioethics. And what we see drawing out of their work is that in part due to the shocking realization of what are called the so-called Nazi medical experiments in the midst of World War II, and then also in response to scandals in Western medicine from the 50s through the early 70s, we had an increased attention to patient autonomy. So Beecher and Childress take this and they institute as one of their principles of biomedical ethics, respect for autonomy. The idea that medical professionals are going to respect the patient's right to make choices based upon their own values. And part of that making choices based on your own values is often understood to include the right to informed consent. The fact that a patient has a right to understand the medical procedures that are being done, why a diagnosis is being made, why a prescription is being given, why a, a method of treatment is being considered. So we see here, in contrast to the Hippocratic tradition, in more contemporary bioethics, we see this turn to the patient's autonomy, the patient's wills and the, the patient's desires are, become, are considered far more important. This doesn't mean you do whatever the, the patient wants to do, but it does mean that they have the right to make their own decisions. So let's look at a really interesting case. So, some of you may have heard about placebos. Some of you may know about placebos. Um, and one of the things that I do in my classes is that I actually have students read just this fascinating 1945 article from a medical journal uh, called A Note on the Placebo. Um, I love this article, also in part because I love that it was Dr. Pepper that wrote this. Um, but so Pepper in A Note on the Placebo really examines for the first time that we can find in medical literature, a discussion of the use of the placebo. And one of the claims that he makes is that placebos, true placebos, which are chemically inert drugs, there's no active component whatsoever, um, that true placebos should be used, can be used to help a patient be better and it, the process of doing so relies upon the patient's belief in the effectiveness of the pill, in the tonic, in the treatment that's going on. So a part of placebos, a part of the prescribing of placebos, a part of the use of placebos, most people take to be that in the, in the therapeutic setting, in the clinical setting, that placebos have to involve the patient truly believing that there is something at work here. And in placebos, the idea is that if I tell you, here is a chemically inert drug that will have absolutely no change to your body chemistry, 
that you'll have no change. So instead, doctors, um, nurse practitioners will prescribe a placebo and say, we have seen some patients with similar conditions to yours have a response to a drug like this. It's not everybody. It's about 20% of people that have a response to it. But I'd like to try it on you because other things just don't seem to be working. And if it's worded in just that way, the idea is that the patient may very well have the placebo effect, may very well be pleased by their outcome. And in the end, basically, the body and the mind itself will be curing or bringing about pain relief or, or other aspects there. Now, you may be wondering right now, how common is this really? Well, studies have shown that somewhere between a quarter and a third of all prescriptions are for placebos. Not all of these placebos are true placebos. Sometimes they're going to be uh, active drugs that are used for other purposes that aren't going to matter. Um, so it would be, for example, giving someone a, um, a small dosage of a diuretic, even though they have no need for a diuretic or a prescription for a heavy dose of vitamin C, even though there's no vitamin C deficiency. Um, aspects like that are sometimes uh, uh, prescribed and used as, as they're going into the therapeutic sense. So we have the situation, and again, somewhere between a quarter and a third of all prescriptions we believe are truly placebic or placebo prescriptions. So if we're going to wonder about if lying is okay in medicine, and we have this example, so we have the example of, of John, the smoker that we're trying to convince not to, to smoke. We have the example of placebos and the potential use of a drug, hopefully a chemically inert drug, um, in order to get someone to feel better without actually giving them any you know, real medicine. We have to perhaps think about the types of lies. And here's something where philosophers have done a lot of work on this. And there's a lot more than what I'm showing here, but just to give you a flavor and a taste of what's going on. So we can think about a lie of omission. So a lie of omission is leaving information out. So this would be leaving out information that might change the patient's mind if we're talking about in the medical context, in the therapeutic context. So a lie of admission might be something like saying, you know, a high portion of people who have the same condition you have also have this risk, risk exposure. But leaving out entirely that that high percentage of people that have that risk exposure might be only those who are male or only those who have had previous exposure to, um, to a certain level of radiation or some other aspect. So a lie of omission is leaving information out. You don't actually tell anything that's false. You don't say anything that's incorrect, but you leave out information that otherwise might cause the patient to make a different decision. So that would be a lie of omission. And so one thing we could wonder about, one thing we can consider is whether or not lies of omission are acceptable when it comes to medical interventions. Another type of lie would be the lie of fabrication. This would be, as the name implies, it's just making things up whole cloth, making things up out of nowhere. So this would be telling somebody that something's the case when it's not the case. This would probably be far more similar to the situation with John's x-ray. So fabricating and saying, look at the spot here. This is something that is concerning and I'm really interested to see what's going on. And if we do these things, we're going to have those aspects. So that would be a lie of fabrication. So that is telling something that you know is false, and you're telling it even though it's false in order to bring about something. This would be the fabrication lie. Now, in contrast to this, we have the polite lie. Uh, the polite lie is a lie that is really indicative of U.S. culture. Um, it's fascinating how few cultures outside of North America have the polite lie. The polite lie is the, I really like your tie today. Or, man, did you do something different with your hair? Those ideas, the things that you, you give a lie that it's, it doesn't mean much. And sometimes we refer to these as white lies, but white lies also have a different context in different settings. But the polite lie is the ones that we might use in opening up a conversation. 
So you can think again in medicine, if we're trying to get a patient to feel comfortable with the medical care team, you might have a variety of polite lies that go on. Gee, I really love your shoes. What kind of music do you like? And oh, man, I really love jazz too. You know, those sorts of things. And so we can wonder if those lies, those lies that are attempting to get people to connect to you at some very, you know, um, some very reasonable level are lies that are acceptable. Now, I always, whenever I mention polite lies, want to bring up this fascinating aspect. We actually do not have a great translation for the, the last term there in English, but in German, we have die Notlüge. So die Notlüge, um, according to some dictionaries, the actual translated as a white lie, though it's far from a white lie. Die Notlüge are lies that are told of necessity. It's the lies of necessity. The, the shining example of this really is the idea of the lie that you, that you give to save somebody else's life. So the, the classic example that we, we always use is, no, Anne Frank's family is not hiding behind the bookcase. Of course not. Um, I mean, not as blatant as that, but the idea of lying to authorities in order to preserve a life would be denote Luca. Now, the question is, in medicine, if you tell lies in order to save somebody's life, in order to convince John to quit smoking, in order to convince an elderly woman to take drugs that she does not want to take, that could be a lie of necessity. It's necessary in order to save that patient's life. So, denot luga. Are those lies ethically correct? Are they ethically acceptable or not? It's a really kind of an interesting question to think through and to consider, is there a line between uh, lies of a mission that are used to try and convince someone to change their aspect or a lie of necessity that you're doing in order to save somebody's life? There have to be an emergency going on in, in some aspect. So those are some of the types of lies that we can consider and think about. Now, key to any analysis, to any thinking about lies in medicine, is you're going to come back to this phrase over and over again in the literature, where people talk about it's a harmless deception. This is something that I'm doing that is not going to cause harm. It's only going to lead to more health. And so if there is no harm, that this is an acceptable deception. And often they'll code it that way. They'll say that it's a deception. They won't say that it's a lie. Um, but there's been a lot of pushback on that and a lot of questions about whether these so-called harmless deceptions actually lead to distrust, to a lack of trust. So when we look at members of communities that do not engage with medicine at the same rate that other people, uh, communities do. So if we look at the African-American population in the United States, we see that they utilize medicine at a far lower rate than white majority culture does. And this is despite controlling for economic standards. If you look at someone who is a middle-class white family, someone who is a member of a middle-class black family, we're going to see a difference in engagement with medical practice. So it's not wholly a question of socioeconomic status. It's a question about a cultural acceptance of medicine. And what we see when we look at minority communities is we see a long history of them not trusting authority figures because they have been lied to so many times. And in particular, when we look at the African-American community, there's a, a touchstone case that we, we look at. I, I discussed it about a week in my classes, which is the Tuskegee study of untreated syphilis in the adult male Negro. And in the Tuskegee study, what happened is that there was a long-term examination of what happened when we did not treat Black men with syphilis to see what the syphilis would look like after five years, after 10 years, after 15 years. And key to this is that the so-called participants in the study did not know they were in a study. In fact, they thought that they were part of a 
government program that was providing them care. So the Tuskegee study is, is an a amazingly complex and interesting study to look at. There's different time frames, different portions of it that have different ethical uh, components and different aspects, but knowledge of Tuskegee in the broad strokes is very widespread in the African-American community. And within those communities, you will often hear, particularly older members of the community say that they're not going to go to doctors because look, we already know what happened with syphilis and those aspects. So we have these questions of distrust that can happen if people determine that they have been lied to in the past. I'll briefly just note that there is a really interesting question about if culture matters. And here I'm gonna use culture in two ways. So one, we have this generational culture going on. So if we look at this rough guide to generations going on here, we can look at my grandparents' generation and say of them that they were far more likely to go along with whatever a physician said, whatever a medical professional said, not challenge them, not question them, and believe what was going on there. As compared to my generation and the generation of current college students that are going to have a far deeper level of um, desire to, to understand what's going on, a desire for greater autonomy, and perhaps even a greater mistrust of those in authority. So we have that cultural aspect, generational understanding. The other aspect, and, and I had to throw this in here because I love Mary Blair's art. She's uh, one of Walt Disney's artists who designed It's a Small World. So if we look at the idea of outside American culture, we also have questions about what the extent to which other cultures value truth-telling to the same extent we do. If you go into many Asian cultures, many Middle Eastern cultures, and many sort of South European cultures, so into sort of Italy, Greece, into the Middle East, and then over into Southeast Asia, you're going to find that there is a uh, broadly speaking, a different understanding of the expectations of truth telling from medical professionals. Um, this sense in which there is far greater seeding of control over to the medical professionals than we tend to see here in American culture. So we really have this question about is it okay to lie in medicine? We almost have to wonder from the context of what culture, generational culture, a, a U.S.-based culture, a broader global culture. All of these things are going to have an impact if we think through what's going on. So if I return back to the question that's the title of this talk, is lying okay in medicine? Uh, I don't really have an answer for you. Um, that's fairly common to, to my classes. One of the things that I do in my classes, one of the things I do in my work, what we do in philosophy, what we do in medical humanities, um, is that we really engage with people to get them to grapple with these issues themselves and understand the competing ideas, the competing tensions, the texts that we could use, the resources we can draw on, so that we ourselves can begin to understand what our own expectations in this instance are for truth-telling in medicine, how much authority we're going to cede to our physicians, to our medical professionals, our nursing practitioners, our um, our pharmacists even, you know, as we're going through in these aspects. So I don't have an answer for you if lying is okay in medicine, but I hope that in this talk, you've already seen some of the ways in which we can come to make more complicated the question and in making it more complicated, actually see a number of avenues of analysis that we can do and that we can think about. And all of those questions are the sorts of things that I would encourage you to do all the time. So thanks a lot, and I hope you have a good day. So uh, thank you, Dr. Kraft, for that. Is there, um, before we jump into questions, anything that you want to add on or reference, ask your own? The only other thing I'd, I'd add is uh, the, the people watching now are, are lucky because not only do they get to see my office here at the campus, but they got to see my basement office at home. So, you know, it's it's all the offices you can take. Very good. I liked how uh, it sort of looked like a stage in like a room and then like you were standing, but it was just your head. So that was a nice touch. <laughs>
Um, so as with everyone with us, if you, um, you don't have to turn your camera on, but if you wanna, you know, show your face so that you're here, show us that you're here, that's fine. If you'd like to unmute at any point and ask a question, you can do that or use the raised hand feature. And again, you can post questions in the chat. We will mind them as well. Um, does anyone off the bat have a question? I've got one ready, so I will get us rolling. I was going to ask about, um, uh, like globally, what, is there one country that's most medically ethical? But you kind of answered that question at the end there. Um, so I will bring it back to our good old USA. Uh, I'm wondering how can we get to the best iteration of informed consent in the current state of the American healthcare system when most doctors are in and out, you know, it sometimes feels like they don't have time for your questions and all that. How do we get there? Yeah, I mean, the, the notion of informed consent and, and the way it, it ties into deception and lying and, and those aspects. So, um, on, on one hand, it seems like it'd be really easy to make the blanket statement of like, we don't want deception, we don't want lying, we, we don't want those things going on. Um, but it's also this sense in, in which we expect certain types of lies anyway. So you, you can think about when, um, when a doctor tells you like, oh, this is just gonna sting for a minute. And you're like, oh, this is gonna hurt all day now. Like, like that kind of notion, like we, we sort of accept what's going on there. Um, and, and if we take that sort of small notion, we think about it in the larger sense of informed consent. It's easiest to think about informed consent in some ways if we're thinking about a surgical intervention because um, in the US, in Canada, in Great Britain, um, I, I know in those areas in Australia, um, to a lesser extent, if, if you move into France and Spain and Germany, sort of the, those westernized uh, primary areas that we see driving the, the conversation that happens around medicine a lot in the US is, is those areas. When we look at, at those countries, one of the things that we see when it comes to informed consent in surgeries is that there is a formal, meaning like a standard, not that you're wearing a, a, a tuxedo necessarily, but a, a formal informed consent moment that happens for surgeries, not, not emergency surgeries, but if you're having your gallbladder out um, in those countries, you're going to have somebody prior to the surgery um, do what physicians call performing informed consent on you. Um, this is almost always the anesthesiologist. So it's almost always the person who is going to be putting you under and monitoring your breathing and heart rate while you're in the surgery. Um, so the anesthesiologist is going to do informed consent with you prior to the surgery. And so you're like there in your hospital gown and you're waiting to be rolled back into the room. And this person that you've not seen before comes over and, and, and says, you know, Gabby, um, so I understand that you're having your gallbladder out today. Um, is that what you think you're here for? And then you go, yes. And then, so here's what's gonna happen. We're gonna put you under, you're gonna be sleepy. You won't feel a thing. You won't know a thing. You'll wake up, you'll be groggy and it'll be like two minutes past. Um, there are some dangers, but they're really minimal. So we're not gonna worry about those too much. Do you understand all of this? And then you go, yes. And then you sign the form. So that's the way that formal informed consent works. And that's a fairly typical interaction right there actually. Um, what's missing in that is actually the other part of informed consent, the broader part that, that people who do medical ethics assume is going on all the time. And so that's talking about the, so why are you having your gallbladder out? And what are the real risks? Not just of anesthesia, but what could happen if you don't do the procedure? What happens if you do the procedure? What are the complications that could happen? Is there a reason why you're preferring doing laparoscopic surgery with like the three little slits and blowing you up with air and, and robot arms coming in doing mm -hmm. stuff um, versus the, you know, it's the 1960s and we're doing a, a huge scar right down your middle as we're, we're going through this. So we can see that even though there's all these things we could be talking out about an informed consent, we're really talking about a very narrow one that we accept. And that's in the surgical interventions, which have better informed consent than a lot of other ones. 
So if you are at your family doctor, you're at your general practitioner, um, you're and you're doing just a routine checkup, um, and they are looking at things like, oh, well, how long have you had that bump? I, I don't know. I've I've never noticed that bump before. Well, let's get that checked out. So and they give you a referral to somebody to do things. They don't do the informed consent at that part of saying like, so it possibly is this thing and that could be the dangers here and those things. So all of those aspects, which seem like they're really normal and expected, um, in the broader sense, we could say these are lies of omission. They're not telling us the whole story. And the reason why they don't, when we talk to physicians, when we talk to nurse practitioners, um, when, when we talk to people um, who are working in and around medicine, well, we don't want to tell them because they're going to freak out. So it's, it's viewed as we'll not tell them everything until we know more because the worry is going to be bad and we don't want them to worry. So it, here's an instance in which we're, as a culture in the West, we are fine with, we are accepting this amount of deception, this amount of lies of omission. Um, because we think it's the patient's benefit. And, and the questions that I really have when I come back to this is, um, I mean, and this is a philosopher's question, <laughs> like where do we draw the line? Like where's the line between telling a four-year-old you're not gonna feel a thing <laughs> when you, you give the four-year-old a shot and going into surgery without telling them that what you really think you're going to be doing is taking off a lobe of the liver. Um, like if that happened, like, no, you can't, you can't do that. You can't have it. Well, where's the line? Like, what's the difference between those aspects? And, and that's what I was trying to point to in, in the, the brief talk. Um, I, I mean, in many ways, I, I could probably talk for hours <laughs> about all of the, the notions around this and, and all the different ways that they work. But so that, that's a, a longish answer to, to your shorter question about the way informed consent plays in. in. In part, I would say, even what we think of as really good informed consent still falls short of what we would think is a complete truth telling. Um, so then the question is, where do we go from that falling short of a standard to a uh, a much bigger falling short of a standard. Mm -hmm. And unless uh, someone else has a question, I guess my follow-up is who is, other than philosophers and, and all that, who is working on this, who's talking about it, thinking about it, trying to make it better? So, uh, so in different ways. So I, I brought props. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have Sistelbach's book, Lying. A uh, huge, huge deal when this book came out in the, the late 1970s. It's still read all the time today. Um, so that's an example where we have someone who's philosophically trained and doing history from a philosophical point of view, doing things. Um, if we look at the fields of medical ethics, bioethics, depending on how you want to define them, people might think of those as slightly different things. Um, if we look at those areas, we're going to see philosophers doing this. But we're also going to find physicians. We're going to find lawyers. We're going to find um, religious figures. We're, we're going to find rabbis, priests, clerics, um, uh, imams that, that are working around in this area. Um, in that larger sense, it comes together into thinking about medicine and how we can approach it for a better ethical standard. And if you come to this discussion, starting from a, a theological religious tradition, the conversation is gonna end up looking different mm -hmm. um, than if you're coming at it from a historical perspective. And so you have medical historians, um, people like my friend, Alice Drager, who, who when she's a medical historian. So when she looks at questions around truth telling in medicine, she starts out, she's like, well, what did they do in Victorian England? Like, that's where she always starts. What did they do in Victorian England? <laughs> and, and moves on from there. Um, so you're gonna have these different approaches as they work through. And at, at least in part, th this talk is, is to explain why something that 
people might not have heard much about before. So the, the notion of medical humanities comes in. So in medical humanities, we have all these different approaches to thinking about medicine that's coming in. So that's where we can get an examination of medicine. And if we use this instance lying, and we can think about it through literature. We could think about it through drama. We can think about it through history. Um, we could pull in the, the so-called soft sciences. So we can pull in sociology, psychology to, to see what's happening there. We could do all of those aspects to understand better what we think we mean when we talk about lying in medicine. Um, and it might very well be that an instance like whether you tell John that there's a worrisome spot on his x-ray that we might find we'd have one reaction to that one. But if we tell the story about um, what we explain to our 87 year old grandmother to try and get her to take a medicine, we might find a different story there. So partly that's that generational line. Um, it's also the sense of like, you can lie to other people, but don't lie to me. <laughs> um, there's all kinds of ways that, that that can happen. And so these questions play out in lots of ways. Um, I'm trained as a philosopher, so I always start out in that direction, but I, I love pulling in those other aspects as, as, they, as they come together. Um, since I showed props, I have to show off my, my other prop here. So I'm, I'm hoping that the camera will successfully reverse here. So here is my little bottle of placebos. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is one of my, my fun finds that when, when you get placebos um, prescribed to you, they actually aren't called placebos, but there are name brand placebos. There are name brand chemically inert drugs. Um, there are generic versions of name brand placebos so that insurance companies will pay for them. Um, it, and it's everything from capsules to tablets to ointments to, to everything that, that happens. Um, and it really was, I mean, it's this question about lying in medicine that interested me and changed the, the course of direction of what I study in philosophy. Um, it, it, it was a question about placebos that I encountered as an undergraduate that led me to shift my focus in the areas of philosophy that I think about. Um, and then that in turn kind of led me to, to keep going down the path to, to be where I am today. So um, that's the other thing is just, you know, what, what seems like, I don't want to say a throwaway example, but it was like a short writing prompt that we had for a class one day that was, you know, here's the story that this pharmacist has to figure out what to do, um, write a paragraph to two response to what about, and I could not stop thinking about it. Um, and in some ways, I'm still thinking about it. Like that, that moment with that professor that I had as an undergrad um, still, you know, drives what I do all the time. That's um, amazing. In, including, because I don't think we mentioned that in, in any of the, the three introductions we gave to myself. Um, so in addition to being here at, at the college, um, I'm on the bioethics team at York Hospital, which is just across the street from, from the college. Uh, so it, it's the case that I regularly am, am working with the physicians and nurses and the administration over there to review um, hospital policy, to, to talk about interesting cases, um, to work with families and to work with medical teams to find an ethical resolution to situations. So I guess that's the other part I would want to make sure people knew is that this, this isn't just, you know, me sitting in my nice chair, like thinking of stuff. Um, I, I do this stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm not that kind of doctor, so I don't get to prescribe things, but I, I work with them and, and talk about these things a lot. Well, it's uh, it's just a great testament, and I will shameless plug, you know, the, the fact that our faculty are doers, you know, your professors, if we have any prospective students, they are working in their fields, um, and, and like you said, getting that, that, uh, that project based and, and doing the doing what they're teaching. So I think that's awesome. Um, any other questions from the audience? Been a little quiet out there. What can we? We got a thumbs up, so I'll take that. Yeah, that's <laughs> great. 
and a clapping hands. Very good. Um, I had one. What was, what was I thinking about? Um, the if you could, I don't quite understand the um, placebo and, and all that. Like, have people have been prescribed that and they don't even know? Yeah. And they could live their whole lives without ever even knowing. Yeah. It's amazing. And there's different versions of it. So uh, um, something close to the question that first got me really interested in. Um, is if you have an elderly patient who has become addicted to sleeping pills and you don't think it's good for Betsy to be taking a strong narcotic every night to go to sleep. But when you raise it with her, she's really worried that if you take away her pill, she's not gonna be able to sleep. Um, so this is an instance in which a physician might switch her over from the medication that she's on, which is an active drug, to a placebo, which is an inactive drug. So the, the, the distinction there is, um, you know, if, if I'm giving someone, I'll think of a really active drug, if I'm giving someone morphine, like I'm, I'm doing something like that has a physiological effect. If I'm giving somebody um, calcium sulfate, that has essentially no chemical reaction in your body. You might, might have a slight difference in the acidic level in your stomach, um, but it's not going to, to have any actual implication. Nothing from that is going to go from the stomach into the lining, absorb into the blood. You're, you're not gonna have any kind of reaction. Um, so we, we, it's a chemically inert drug. It, it, it doesn't do anything. So if we cause that switch over to happen and we can successfully get, uh, I forget now if they called her Betty or Betsy, it was one or the other. Uh, um, if, if, if we get her to change over from the sleeping pill that she's on to something else, then we could remove a potential future complication of her being on a heavy duty narcotic. So it might be at some later point, we'd want to give her painkillers, but if she's already tolerating this very high dose of the narcotic, um, we're gonna have problems so we can wean her off. So how do you do that? Well, the, the most efficient way to do that is, that is that you say, well, Betsy, I mean, you have been on these a long time and I'm really worried about you remaining on these. There is a new drug out that I've heard about and it's supposed to be very effective in cases like yours. People that take this say they sleep like babies. And that's really powerful. So that we're really not giving this out to very many people. Your friends might not be on it. But I'd like to try and switch you over because I'm worried about how well you're going to keep sleeping since you've been on this same drug for three years now. Let's switch you to this other one and see if it has an effect. Now, if you cross your fingers and you're lucky, She's going to think that this is a better drug than what she had before. Um, the other possibility is, is that she tries like, oh, it doesn't work. I need to go back to my old stand standby. But if she switches over, you have now taken her off of an active drug that has a potential negative side effect on, on her health to something which has effectively no impact on her health. And if she thinks that the pill is still making her sleep, so she'll take it. And then 20 minutes later, like, oh, I'm getting kind of sleepy and, and we'll fall asleep. So, I mean, this is, is the, the idea behind those types of placebos. Uh, placebo is Latin for I will please. Um, so it's, you're pleasing the patient and it's utilizing the, the healing powers of the mind, like the, the mind telling the body what to do. Um, and there is lots of literature that shows that this is successful. Um, it's about 20% of the time. Mm -hmm. um, and this isn't only for so-called fake drugs, like the, the sleeping pill I was talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, we can do placebo surgeries. Um, and wow. people who don't actually have a surgery, but have like the laparoscopic incisions done, <laughs> um, they end up reporting about 20% of them report oh, my pain is so much better. I have no problems. I'm so glad that I went through with this procedure uh, when nothing actually happened physically. Like they had, uh, you know, uh, an incision done and then they sutured up 
and off they went. Um, so they are really effective. Um, but the problem that happens here, and this is where, where I really worry, <laughs> is what happens to Betsy? What happens to her after you've switched her over from the narcotic to the placebo? If three months from now, when she goes to refill the placebo, a new pharmacist, a pharmacist aide is like, why are you taking this? This doesn't do anything. Suddenly, Betsy discovers that she's been lied to. And so what does that mean for the next time that she has something? Is she going to trust the doctor? Is she going to go to the doctor when she has things? Or is she just going to turn to her friends and WebMD and, and figure out what's going on? There? So that's one of, it's not maybe a, a philosophically pure reason, because <laughs> it's not like you shouldn't lie because lying is bad. But practically, like there is this question of, when patients discover they've been deceived, they might not come back. Um, and that's why I was drawing in the Tuskegee study, this way in which now they didn't even know they were in a study, um, but the way in which you had these 600 men learn, well, those who were survivors at the point where it became public, which it's about 120 of them were still alive at that point. Um, learn that they had been lied to for 40 years. And then it's the community around them learns about this. And so this is part of, it's not the only reason, it may not even be the primary reason now because we're a good 45 years since Tuskegee broke, um, broke public. Um, but it's one of the reasons why we think that we do see a lower incident rate for African-Americans going to, um, going to see physicians, uh, even if, as I said in the recording, even if we control for economic factors, even if we control for social standing factors, there is a deeper distrust of medicine um, that is, you know, honestly and really justifiable based upon the history of treatment. Um, and that's one where we, where we saw this long deception. It was a 40-year deception. People for 40 years thought they were getting treated and they weren't. Um, that has an impact for a long time. And to come out of that is taking generations of people working around medicine to try and repair that harm. Yeah, I mean, you can look at the current with the statistics with COVID. It's, mm -hmm. it's there, it's very present for us right now. It's just, it is amazing to me that someone or a group of people thought this will be a good idea. I, yeah. It's mind blowing. Um, it's a horrible, horrible, horrible study um, that is fascinating to read about, to, mm -hmm. to see all of the issues and all the problems and, and how the deception contributed in, in those aspects. Mm -hmm. um, and like, like I said in, in the video, in, in my medical ethics class, um, we spent about a week, maybe a week and a half talking about the study, reading the original documents, seeing testimony from people who were in the study, um, really understanding what, what was going on there. Um, which also, I mean, that points back to the interdisciplinary way that, that these questions, these ethical questions in medicine are, that it, it's not just a philosopher saying lying is bad and you shouldn't lie. It's, it's we come to it with this critical eye and, and we utilize historians and journalists and novelists and, and all of these other aspects that happen. Mm -hmm. uh any looks like we probably have time for one more question does anyone in the audience have one any questions all right well i think then uh mm -hmm. we are going to wrap it up um any closing remarks dr craft i would just say for those of you who are potential students um i have been here at york college now for 15 years um, it has become a home and I, I love my students, I love my colleagues, and I, I think that if it is a good fit for you, you should come. And the way to figure out if it's a good fit is talk to the people here, talk to the people of missions, reach out to the faculty and, and let us know what you want to do and what you're thinking about. And we will help you know if we're the right place for you. And I hope we are. 
I second all of that. Yep. And we have a virtual open house coming up on uh, April 10th, Saturday, April 10th. So starts at 10 a.m. Eastern time. You can find that on the website if you just put that in the search bar. Um, and again, we have Spartan Speaks uh, more series coming up uh, next week, Tuesday, March 30th. We have from one of our hospitality professors, how to get the most out of your travel experiences, which maybe we'll be doing more of soon, which is kind of funny timing. I'm sure he'll be referencing that. Um, but again, thank you, Dr. Kraft. Thank you all for being here and have a great night. Thank you all.